Yeah, so I was between Malak and Flannery. You like Malak a lot? Mm-hmm. Well, her. No, she was our child professor. It's time to roll off, I think. She's a delight. She was at the Swanwick Village, was it? Yeah. Wait, who is, um, what's his name? Is Steve in your cohort? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I knew to know that because he told me that that was his child professor. So I'm putting her picture on the line. She short hair. hair. Yeah. I'm she like, has long like, hair in person. All right, everybody, welcome. And we're glad you are here with us today. You know it's Halloween. So thank you for those who have your Halloween gear on. And in the true spirit of Halloween, we have some candy and some fruit snacks outside. So make sure you help yourself before you leave today. But thank you for coming to our Lunch and Learn. And we're really excited to have a few folks from the library. Uh, Kristen Kirkessler and Robert Carroll are here to talk to you about doing research in the library and all the tools and tips you can use. And then we'll have Karen Ischler joining us in a little bit to talk about dissecting and reading research articles. So all the good tips and tricks you need to move into this next part of the semester, especially with finals coming. So I'll turn it over to Kristen and Robert. Thank you. Happy Halloween. <laughs> Enjoy your food. That's the main thing. We're, we're going to be kind of background when you eat, so you know. Just <laughs> um, as we have a nice small group. <laughs> so uh, we are indeed from the library, your library, the Harris Library. You know where it is. Uh, our website, there it is. Here you can find which is actually seven days a week, but it's a little shorter on weekends. And our librarians are only here, eight thirty to five. Wait, stop for just I'm a second. Stopping already. I have a quick question. Are you on? It looks like you're on mute, or is that? Okay, I just want to make sure. Sorry Thank about you. that. No, you're fine. <laughs> Am I on mute? Can you hear me? Okay, good. All right. All right, so. uh, and we're trying to uh, kind of line up with uh, Dr. Ishler's presentation. She's looking at articles, uh, academic uh, journal articles, and how to use them. And we're going to show you quickly how to find them. Uh, should we just launch into that? Or are we good? Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah. So. What we want to do is, you know, assuming you have a, a, an assignment or some research you're doing on a particular idea, topic, subject, how do you start finding those articles? And we want to show you how to do it in a quick way. There are many different ways. Some are a little more targeted. So what we need is a subject, or if anyone has any subject ideas for articles to look for, we'll take your suggestions. If not, we're prepared. We'll come up with one. Anybody? Uh, yes. Um, groups for the uh, like group work for the elderly. Yeah, great. Elderly. Excellent. All right. Okay. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to go under find items here on the Harris. There's one thing to remember with the Harris Library or with the, libra um, the case libraries and in general, are there is there are numerous different ways to access resources. So today we're going to go under find items, and we will start with um, looking at our topic with the discovery search or the dis or um, the discovery service. So we go ahead. And so open what this that up. does is it searches kind of everything, all our different collections. It'll look in the databases, but it's also going to come up with books and other materials. But we can limit it to just articles just academic journals if we want to. Mm -hmm. And if you um, come across, if um, when you go into one of the databases and you come across this yellow banner up here at the top, just go ahead and click on it. I'm not logged in, so I'm gonna have to log in. But if you're already logged into your email or Canvas, you can do that. And I'm terrible with passwords, so close your eyes because I'm gonna have to look at it while I enter it. I'll probably look at it after this. Yeah, security first, you know. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right. So I'm logging in. Yeah, I've been wanting to change my password. So I guess this is the, my golden opportunity. 
So anyway, um, when you go into the, so basically when you click into the discovery search, it will go into the basic search. So we'll go ahead and click on advanced search to pull up the multiple search boxes. And so you were saying um, you wanted to do group work with the, you wanted to look at group work with the elderly. Mm -hmm. All right, so start with our first concept, group work. And we'll and couple things to keep in mind. Um, we'll just keep it simple first and search for group work by itself. If you just um, if you just run search without choosing anything, it will um, it will pull it. Um, this is what this is one way you can do it. You can just do a simple keyword search. And um, what we'll do first before we forget anything else is to just make sure to select things that are available at CWREU Libraries and Ohio Link. So with these limiters, when you get these huge results, you can start cutting it down to what you're really looking for. We'll do some more after this. Yeah. So, Robert, what are some yes. other things that I can do to refine this? I just searched on a simple well, keyword. Well, let's say I did, I guess, the population we're talking about, elderly or mm -hmm. geriatric. So, we can do old. Oops. It'll probably recommend, Elder. like it gives us other suggestions. Yep. So you'll notice when you type into these databases, they'll often um, give you other suggestions. Another thing to take note of is when you're entering in your um, searches in these boxes, if you are searching more than one word and you're not searching for it as an exact phrase, you want to combine them with or. So we'll look for either, it will look for items that have either one of these words, some of these words, or all of these words. So does that make sense? Great. So we'll run this. So right now, before I run the search on group work alone, we've got about, um, 50, it looks like we've got about 58 million articles or items, not just articles, books and other items in the entire um, Case Western Reserve or just about the entire Case Western Reserve University library collection. We are going to like reduce this significantly by adding these search terms. We'll get it down to a couple of million. We know. <laughs> so... So we're going to run it, and now we are down to 12 million. <laughs> we need to do something here. Yes, yeah. so there's a couple of things you can do. Um, the next thing, what, what do you think about subject headings, Robert? Well, I don't know. I like subject headings personally, but yeah. So we might want to uh, do these drop downs of the selective field. Subject meaning it should be relevant and important enough concept that it's considered a subject for the article, not that it's just those words pop up here and there. So that should cut it down a little bit. Um, we also, I don't think it's noted in just journals or just articles. Yeah, yep, we'll get to that in just a second. Okay. So yeah, let's see what happens if we like limited this. So you'll see the numbers drop. We'll just do it alone with group work. It's going to Robert. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is a question in the chat. How recent should resources be year-wise? That's, that's the next limiter we're going to look at. Yes. Okay, we're yes. Look at that. And that, of course, depends on what you're doing. But yes, that will cut it way down, too, if we want to. So we'll show you how to do that in just a moment. Yeah, it depends on a variety of things. Yeah, it could be on what your um, professor asks for or, like, the nature of the type of research that you're doing. So, um so we've limited, so we've cut it down to like, now we've cut it down even more down to 24,000, but I haven't applied, we haven't applied the subject, um, looking for subject terms for the second search box. So we're gonna do that next. So when you do that again, we're now down to like 6,000, but that is, that's going across different, across like the entire like case library. So this is a good resource to use if you need to find like several articles like in a hurry, essentially. So the next thing is we're gonna go into these limiters that Robert talked about. So should we do scholarly peer reviewed journals, you think, Robert? I think we should. Yes, how about you all? Think we should go for it? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Getting it, we're getting, we're winning it down. We're now down to like, um, like three thousand articles here. But we also have, we have publication dates from like nineteen thirty nine to twenty twenty three. So if you want to look for something like, um, 
like um What's how many years do you think you should look for five five okay so we'll do 2018 so you can either use the slider here you can either type it in here or what's more fun is to use the slider <laughs> depends how like exact your aim is it's fun yes yeah. there we go go let go so i just adjusted it from 20 to 2018 so now we're down significantly more and there are other ways you can like limit this as well i mean these are going across like we're searching in the library catalog as well as like a whole bunch of research databases so well, it's also still kind of a general topic maybe there's some particular problem or issue in the general topic but the other thing too is we can also um, do a search in a in um, another database like AgeLine or PsychInfo, which is going to be a little bit more targeted to your subject area. So if we want to use the, um, we could go ahead and use the same example. Or does somebody else want to try a search? Yes, go I have ahead. A question. Mm -hmm. So when we uh, like limited it by the subject title, like where is that pulling from? Because like some of the like literal titles, like I like there's one example that I don't think that should do with elder or group um, work. So is it just like somewhere in the abstract or something? Like where does that information? It should be in the subject heading. So yeah, we could do. That. Yeah, part of it could be yeah. Like um, if you click on like we'll click on number three. It was just like one that I read. It looked like there were like two that I didn't see a like big connection. Yeah, you may not see it in the title. Some at some point someone added it as a subject for that article. Maybe it's not really the central subject. Maybe it's but yeah, the and other there are many other ways than these drop downs to limit it. You could limit it to search just in the abstract if those words appear in the abstract or in the, the title even. Uh, and that will cut it down even farther. Yeah. Another approach you could try is like putting the actual term in like quotation marks to search for the exact phrase. That used to be like something that would work reliably. In recent years, I've noticed there's a bit more variance on how like the search algorithms, like basically how the searches run, kind of interacts with that. But that's kind of like the standard thing you do if you're looking for an exact phrase. So to make sure it doesn't search for the two words separately. Yeah. So is this even like Are we frozen here? I'm not. Oh, here we are. Yeah, so now I did it as an exact phrase. Let me just like oh, look at our results. Now. Yeah, now we're down to like 22 results, which is much more now it's manageable. focused. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, which is a much more manageable. So, so that makes a difference as well. You can see that group work is a subject here. And if let's take a look at um, this first record here. Or actually, let's see. You can also see a lot of these have the PDF for the full text you can get right now. Uh, even if they don't, that's the reason to contact us. If you can't get a hold of the article, we can usually find it for you. Yeah. Quickly. Yeah. If you go into like a search um, and basically each search um, search result um, will also. So as you can see, this one's available both in full text, immediate, in immediate full text, both with PDF and HTML. We also, um, and also, um, I was going to mention something too, and it totally like came out of my mind here. Oh, I didn't want to do that one. These are like, I think these are like conference proceedings. So if we go into like an academic journal article here, like you can see each item has like a particular flag of what it is. Like if you take a look at source to kind of tie in with what Karen is going to be, um, what Dr. Ishler is going to be talking about next um, about, um, you know, research or basically journal articles and the different components that makes one makes them up like this in this source, you can see it's in Journal of Social Work and it tells you also when it was published and also it's volume 23 issue two and then the page number range. Also, what's helpful is um, looking at the keywords. Um, this particular record doesn't have and sometimes you'll see the subject headings listed. A couple of other useful things to mind too is um, there's some tools in like these databases. Like um, you can cite, if you click cite here over here on the right, it will generate a citation for you. 
um, and you can choose your style like APA seventh edition. So what you could do is you can actually grab this and copy and paste it into your references. Um, however, we do want to like give you a little word of caution. Sometimes these aren't always perfectly formatted. So pay attention to like punctuation and capitalization. But what's helpful is you actually have the components of the citation there. So it's just a question of just proofreading and just making sure that the minor details are taken care of. Does that make sense? Where did you click to find that? Just the citation report? Yeah, it's on here on the... Um, Right hand side, yeah, under site. Can you see where I'm like highlighting here? Like, do you see that gray thing there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, of course. Also, you can save a link to get back to your search results. Um... <laughs> yes, and the permalink is the last item in yeah. the under the tools. Here, let me let me move this. <laughs> I wonder if there's a way, sorry, I had that up there and I didn't realize it here. I'll just move that there so you can see. So it's under the tools here is like all these little things that I, we were pointing at. So yeah, if you want to say, if you want to link directly to the article, you can click permalink and it will generate it right here and you can copy and um, paste it basically. And so, you, can, you can save your whole search results list the same way. Uh, so you don't have to view the same search over and over. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the other thing too is, um, do you think we have enough time to um, do a quick search and like We're down to about three minutes? Yeah. Does anyone have any questions so far? Yes. Can you save the uh, the search results? Yeah. Should we go back to the search list? You mean to like see the whole list of everything you just yeah. we just found? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, basically what you do is you just go back here to so to save your search results and this works in like all the databases have this um, capability. Most of these databases that you're going to search, including this one, are EBSCO host databases. So essentially to save your search results, what you do is you go to share. And then you can like add like um, we've got 22 results. So if your list is short enough, you can just, um, you know, select results and the number. And then go up to like your go up to the folder here. And then what you will do is you'll select all. And then you can either you can either um, email them to yourself. You can um, save them as like a web page, or you can export them. Like if you hit export, you can export them into your favorite. Um, your, your favorite citation manager. Like most people here use um, Zotero. I know some also use Mendeley and I think there's some other people around campus who use like EndNote, but then you can you can um, choose your format here. So if you're using, um, if you are using um, Zotero, you would want to save it in this first option, the RAS format. Um, it also, and then it tells you other um, tools that use it as well. And then you can select the option to remove these app and from the folder after saving and then hit save. I usually leave this on check and just remove them manually because sometimes things, weird things can happen. And then what it will do is it'll export it into an RAS file and then you can import it into Zotero or whatever your favorite um, citation manager, manager is. But there's also just the really quick permalink version, right? Where yes, can, yes. So just to if, kind of... If that seemed complicated, which it is a little to me, frankly. You can, yeah. You can also just do... Uh, oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, so we're going to go back here. So we're back in the search results, and then we can go under share. And then just to search the... To save the entire search, you just go under use permalink. See, it's right and then there. you just highlight it, and then you can copy and... Save that paste email it in. to yourself. Yeah, and then go back to it later, so. Well, it looks like we are uh, sadly running out of time, but at least we, we gave you an overview of how to find articles. Good, okay. <laughs> any, yes. any last minute questions before and, we run out of here? And oh, then yes. if you want to ser search um, our databases separately, you can always go to find articles related to social mm -hmm. work and nonprofit management, and this will take you to this page. This takes you directly to the databases and you can select databases based on topics. Yeah, so subjects. Yeah. So our earlier topic aging and then 
you can, um, so I selected aging from the drop down. So you can either go, like, if you want to go to psych info, you can go to P for psych info, or like you can go to a, to a topic. So again, I just went under, it was defaulted to all subjects. And I just went to aging since we were talking about group work with the elderly. So, and then uh, this one database you might want to try is like age line. And we've got all sorts of other topics that you can explore. Yeah. Yeah, that was a really quick overview. There's a, really a lot more to it, but at least that should be a starting point, we hope. Yep. And just to kind of quickly refresh, if you go back to our homepage, you have our contact information, oh, if yeah. it would cooperate, and I can actually click on it. So if you want to get a hold of a librarian quickly, you can email Harris Ref, R-E-F, Harris Ref at case.edu. And it's up there, it is. And one of us will reply. Uh, we can answer questions through email or over Zoom, in person, on the phone, whatever you need. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Library. <laughs> and we want to remind everybody, if you're in the thick of your research and you don't recall all the things Kristen and Robert said, email, call, they are very responsive and always willing to help students. So I just want to put another plug in for the library. This even if you're stuck on something and you're not sure where to go. Please use our Harris Library, they're great. And in our building, even better. <laughs> All right, so we're going to switch gears and I'll introduce Dr. Karen Ishler, who's going to talk to you about how to dissect and read through research and scholarly articles. So thanks. Along to you. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. And thanks to the library. Um, just plug for the library. Uh, I remember being very early on a grad student sort of thought I was a hot shot. I know how to search. What do you, I don't need to go to the library. And I was struggling a little bit because I was coming up with thousands of references when I just needed a couple hundred references. And um, I went to the library, met with the librarian at the time, and I can't tell you how helpful it was. I mean, they just know tips and tricks that, you know, we could spend all day trying to teach you and you don't really know it. You won't learn it till you need it. So um, here we go. So there's a handout that's going around for folks. Um, and hopefully I put a copy of the PDF in the chat as well. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen for this part of the presentation. And I hope it'll be a little bit uh, interactive for folks. I appreciate you spending your afternoon here um, on Halloween and I appreciate Eeyore and anybody else who's dressed for the occasion. All right, so my topic today is really on um, how to, is there something I need to do? I think you're good. Okay. If you need to make the people smaller. Okay, me too. Thanks. Okay, great. Okay, so my topic today is really, um, how do you, once you find some articles of interest to you, how do you break them down and make sense of them? But um, thinking back to like your high school biology class when you maybe had to do a dissection of a big a frog or a worm. Um, and I will admit I'm a little bit of a geek, so I was excited about that prospect. Many of you may not have been. Um, but your instructor didn't just set you loose with a scalpel and the frog pinned to the tar, right? You had a couple classes that oriented you about what it is you were going to find when you cut open the frog so that you knew what you were going to see. You didn't just randomly cut into a leg and be like, oh, is this muscle? Is this a tendon? Is this a ligament? So you need some background just to be able to understand what it is that you're finding. And then uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how to prioritize some of those uh, different types of articles, and then um, end with how do you actually dissect the pieces, pull them out, take a look at them, and then help make sense of them. Um, you all, some of you are, I recognize you from maybe last year, um, and had you in class in 528, but many of you haven't had SAS 528 yet, right? Okay, so some of this content will be a preview to a task that you're going to have to do next semester, so I hope you'll, it'll give you a leg up um, on what you'll need to do next year. So my objectives for today are really to talk to you about the kinds of scholarly articles that you're likely to find when you do a search, um, go through the anatomy of those articles, and then talk to you about how to dissect them. 
So when I say a scholarly article, um, I'm really talking about something that is published in a peer-reviewed journal, okay? Um, so it's not Psychology Today or the NASW magazine. It's actually uh, a publication that is um, published and the articles have been reviewed by a group of researchers, okay? And they vetted the articles so that we know that uh, somebody wasn't just making up the data. Okay. So when you think about different types of scholarly articles, what do you think about? What kinds of articles might you see if you opened up the face page of a journal? Okay. So many of them might have really long titles to them. Okay. So that's true. Go ahead. The abstract. So you might see an abstract when you actually get into the article, but let's back up a second and go, let's look at the table of contents of a journal that you might have. Um, what kinds of articles might you see in that journal? Nope. Okay, let's look at one. So if I pull open, I'm just gonna pull open the latest issue of the Journal of Social Work and Research, okay? So this is typical of a peer reviewed journal. They're gonna list for you all the editors that were involved, the people that might review articles that are submitted. And then we get to a table of contents, okay? This should start to look a little bit familiar to you. So they're usually organized around different types of scholarly work. And they could be anything from a, an invited article that has been submitted um, and people say, hey, you know, Dr. Ishra, I know you're doing this work. How about you submit an article um, on this special topic that we're doing? Or a commentary, like you have a particular uh, perspective on a new policy or new intervention that's out and you want to offer it to your peers. Um, and then we have research articles. Right, So that's what we tend to think about. Your comment about really long titled articles, those will be your research articles, right? Um, these, this is a pretty long title here, Learning from Practitioners Serving LGBTQ, blah, 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 two sentence title. That's a research article, all right? So there are different types of articles that you might find in a journal. So it's not just all research. Um, there are different types of things that we might want to look at. Okay, let's get back to PowerPoint. Okay, so I've listed for you here different types of articles that you might actually see inside of a journal. Um, and so there might be things that are really not relevant to you. Um, if you're trying to find out, let's say, um, what's known about, like I do work on autism caregiving, okay? People who uh, have a family member with autism, and they require care for much of their life and assistance. If I'm really interested in like what kind of problems do family members face, then I'm not particularly interested in reading a commentary about that. I'm more interested in original research, for example, that might get published about that. Um, I might not be interested in, for example, uh, a study protocol where somebody describes how they did an experiment to look at, let's say, how autistic people have difficulty meeting eye contact. And so they randomize people into two groups. That's not really my interest. I'm interested in caregiving. So I really want to be discerning in the kinds of articles that I'm looking for. And mostly I'll be looking for research reports, either short research reports or original research reports. Occasionally I might be looking at a theoretical or a conceptual paper. But um, I think the biggest heading that you guys want to pay attention to is looking for empirical articles. So if I say an empirical article, what does that mean to you? It's um, been uh, like looked over by other scientists. Okay, so that's part of the peer review process, and that definitely an empirical article does typically have that feature. Go ahead. There's data gathering. Okay, so that's sort of the key feature. It doesn't mean that I necessarily had to go out and gather all my own data. I could use data that have been collected for other purposes. So for example, I could use a, uh, they conduct routinely a national longitudinal study 
of students who leave special education. And it so happens that a subpopulation of them have autism. I can go into that database that's publicly available, extract the autistic student data, and then do a research study around their needs. So it doesn't mean that I had to collect it myself, but it had to be database. Somewhere along the line, someone collected data. Yeah. Um, this is kind of going back a little bit, and it wasn't said on the slide. Do literature reviews count as scholarly articles? Okay, so yes, that's a good question. It, they do, in fact, count as scholarly articles. Um, but when we ask you to do empirical articles, so if we in 528, you'll have to find like six empirical articles you won't be able to use a literature review. But if you're really smart about it, you want to go find a literature review because that'll help you get up to date on what's been done. So yes, they are considered scholarly, but generally not empirical. The only time they become empirical is if I wanted to do a systematic review of all the studies that have been done, for example, on the extent to which uh, autistic persons have difficulty with social interaction actions and communication, and I looked across like 50 articles and tried to summarize the findings that have been done, then that becomes a different type of article. And many people would say that because I've collected those data, it would be an empirical article. Good question. Did you have another question? Was there one that I didn't answer? No. Okay. So empirical really involves the collection of data. Um, the authors either collected the data themselves or they were responsible for analyzing the data that's in hand. And it could involve, so when we go out and collect our own data, we call that primary data collection. If I use that National Longitudinal Transition Study of special ed kids, then that would be secondary data analysis. I didn't collect the data. I'm going to do analysis on it with my own research question, but it's secondary because I didn't collect it. Both of which are empirical data. Study types could be anything. I'm primarily a quantitative researcher, so I would be looking for quantitative articles, but occasionally, the best articles in my topic area, my, my subject area, might be qualitative in nature. So just quickly, what's your understanding of the difference between qualitative research and quantitative research? Anybody, go on your way, front it. What do you got for me? Yes. <laughs> I should be correct because I'm in second year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just pick one and tell me something about it. Qualitative or quantitative? Qualitative is more like a review of um, studies. Okay. And quantitative, quantitative, quantitative includes variables, uh, you know, numbers, number okay. of studies, and all this. All right. Stuff. So Pranit has really nicely summarized a key difference between qualitative and quantitative. And the quantitative stuff will have numbers in it. It'll have, they'll talk about variables. They're going to look at relationships or differences between variables and groups of people or summarize descriptions about people um, or do some really fancy analysis where they look, what are the predictors of social communication problems among autistic people? Qualitative, just a minor adjustment to your um, offered explanation, is more about an in-depth understanding. So it's not necessarily a review of prior literature. It is often a collection of new data, but it's done through extended interviews or immersion with the subject population. We've studied lots of famous studies over time, right? You guys have heard about uh, Straight Quarter Society um, and other people who've gone in and done like ethnographic studies of particular populations. Maybe they lived with indigenous people in Alaska or Maui tribe or whatever. Um, these are qualitative research studies where the goal is not to calculate, uh, differentiate, uh, or numerically try to capture something, but more to describe and understand in great detail. There's also mixed method studies where people blend the two approaches. Okay, so the data that someone analyzes could be in the form of interviews, could be questionnaires or surveys, it could be observations. People also could analyze media. Like um, you could look at books that have been published on a topic or look at tweets. Um, so I know in my class um, for our qualitative exercise, I had students code um, the posts on Twitter 
about um, the serial killer uh, series that was being done when they did Jeffrey Dahmer, right? And there were a lot of sort of different kinds of quotes from people, people who were saying, this is great, this is a really interesting topic. Other people were saying, hey, look, this really um, exploits families of the people who were killed, and it almost does victim blaming. So you can analyze anything. Anything can be a piece of data. And that's what's kind of neat about research. All right, so people have data, they've published their data. Now you see words like this next to particular kinds of articles, right? So you locate a study, um, and let's say you don't find a literature review, but you find uh, a pre-experimental study or a randomized clinical trial or a systematic review. It's up to you to figure out, okay, what's the strength of the evidence that's offered here? And we use a tool called the hierarchy of evidence, okay? As you move up the hierarchy, these are studies that have more robust and stronger ability to direct us in practice, okay? So I'm not going to make a decision about the kind of uh, intervention that I do with autistic youth from a study that's down here, but I will make uh, an intervention from studies that are more toward the top of the hierarchy. So any thoughts about what kinds of things should be at the bottom or the top? God, you look like you were maybe wanted to raise your hand. I think the randomized control trial should be. Um, okay. So a randomized control trial should be up near the top. Why is that? Like, what do you think? Because they just sound good. I mean, <laughs> nice. I mean, um, because it's more like the validity and the reliability is. Okay. Uh, All right. So stronger. you come from psych background, maybe? Mm -hmm. Psychology. Mm -hmm. And second year. Our, our, and your second year. So you've had 528 a little bit too. Um, so the idea is that there are certain kinds of studies that have more ability to draw causal conclusions. They have more validity. Um, they have better replicability. And those are things like your randomized clinical trials. Those are places where we randomly assign people to different arms of treatment. We don't know what treatment they get. Often they don't know what treatment they get. And it allows us to, at the end of the day, say, yes, this treatment made a difference. As opposed to something like a cross-sectional study or a qualitative study that's really done one point in time, maybe you interviewed 20 people and you got a really in-depth understanding of their experience, but you don't really have any good way to say this is a causal impact, right? So you're absolutely right. A randomized clinical trial should be up there near the top so should something that I mentioned earlier, a systematic review or a meta-analysis. When I said before, if you go one step further from a lit review, you can actually take data from those 20 different studies that you collect or that you found and average the effect over them and come up with some estimate. Boy, if we did an intervention with this age youth, we will improve their communication scores by 20%. That's really valuable information. And that's why systematic reviews and meta-analyses belong at the top of the hierarchy. We're no longer limiting to ourselves to the findings from one particular study, but we're going across studies instead. So um, just to help you out here, here are the answers. If you sort of thought, okay, maybe that should be at the top or the bottom. Let me see. Again, the RCT is going to be toward the top, and the uh, systematic reviews also at the top, and your sort of single time studies, qualitative studies are going to be toward the bottom. So when you're thinking about how do you make a decision about what's the best approach for practice or policy, you want to try and get higher up in the hierarchy, find those studies that have more ability to help you make a good decision. All right, so. The anatomy part, now we know what we're looking at in terms of the kinds of studies that we want to find. Um, let's talk about the anatomy. And um, I think somebody over here, and I can't remember who, said that we could identify one particular thing that we might find in an article, which might be what? An abstract, okay? 
So an abstract is a part of a journal article, and you should find it in every scholarly journal article that you would encounter. Okay. What's something else you might find in a scholarly journal article? Yeah. Okay. They should all have some sort of conclusion or wrap up, you know, a shorter statement about what they found and the impact. Yes. Okay. All of them should have a method section. If they collected data, remember that's the definition of empirical. There has been data collected and analyzed, then they should tell you how they did it. Okay, so they should have a method section. Anything else? They should definitely have results section. Very good. So there should be a specific section where they tell you exactly what they found in the study. Not the implications, not the extensions of it, but the actual finding, just the facts. Product. Okay, so lots of times they should tell you what their objective is. Sometimes you'll see this as what was the purpose of the study or the research aim or even a research question, but it may also be framed as just an objective. What's the first thing you see after the abstract when you look at an article? An introduction. Sometimes it's not actually named as an introduction, but they should all have it. They have to sell you on their study why it was important, what the, the social problem is. I mean, these are all things you guys have to do in papers that you write, right? So they have to do it, but they have to do it quickly to move into how they went about collecting their data. All right, so there are, I think we've got most of the parts of an article. In that method section, know that there's usually some description of the sample. There's some description of the measures that they used. Um, and then there's some description of the analysis that they did. Was it a qualitative analysis and how did they approach it? Was it a quantitative analysis and what did they do? Results may have other things like tables and graphs and figures to help show you what they found. All right, so how do you dissect a journal article? How do you open the frog? Now that you know what's in there, the different pieces and parts, how do you go about looking at it and reading it? Part of it will depend on your purpose. Are you just reviewing this set of literature to provide some generalizations about the field? Or are you tasked with a very specific idea of summarizing what's been done and how well it's been done? Or figuring out a plan for how you're gonna design your group intervention or your individual intervention or the policy that you're gonna recommend? So your different purpose will help direct you in how you read. But I would say that 95% of what you need is where do you think it is? You had 10 minutes with an article, where are you gonna spend it? Abstract. In the abstract, absolutely, right on keyboard, okay? <laughs> abstract is your number one go-to, okay? 95% of the information that you need is gonna be in that abstract, all right? Now, does that mean you don't ever have to look at anything else? No, because there are, for a literature review, for substantive critical analyses of policies or interventions, you're going to have to dig a little bit deeper. But let's talk about where you would dig to be able to find what you need. So I've listed on the right some specific things that you should find within a journal article, okay? And on the left are our sections of the journal article. <laughs> Lots about where you're going to find one or more of these things. Okay, remember, like first answers are easy picking because you get to pick which one you're going to identify goes where. So match something up for me. No, I'm not trying. No, I'm going to not call on the front Somebody else, match something up. Is it a type of study and design in the abstract? Okay, so the type of study and the design should be presented in the abstract. They absolutely should be. There are times though when it may not be listed as clearly for you. Um, and then in that case, where do you think it would go? If it wasn't in the abstract, it should be in the introduction. Yeah, it should be part of the introduction. The, the study design should really be part of the introduction because all that introduction should lead up to why are you doing this study, all right? Match something else up for me. Go ahead. Search directions okay. and references. And where would you put those? References. Okay. So the references would be the sites that you used in your study. 
but I, it should be toward the end of the article. So what's just, your second in discussion? In discussion. Okay, right on. Yes, okay. So the references are just the list, but they might contain directions for future research, but your discussion of what the future the future research should be or the author's discussion about where to go next should definitely be in the discussion section. Good job. Anything else? Okay, where should they be? Okay. All right, so in the method section, absolutely right. Um, those should be definitely in the method section. Any description of the study participants, their characteristics should definitely be there. Go ahead. Would the description of relevant prior studies be an introduction or discussion? Well, absolutely an introduction because again, you're tr the author's trying to set up the rationale for their study. So they should tell you what has been found. Now, I would say that nine times out of 10, they'll come back to that in the discussion because then our job as authors is to put into context what we found. So if I didn't find that, let's say, caregiver education was related to caregiver distress over their caregiving situation uh, to an autistic young adult, but other studies had, then I need to talk about that in my discussion session and address it. Maybe it was because all my caregivers were much older or there's something unusual in my sample. Okay, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So here are where most of these are going to be found. First of all, notice the asterisk that many of the basic elements will definitely be found in the abstract, okay? It's for some of these other things that you may have to dig a little bit further. So, but besides the references, what section do you see cited the least? Where are the fewest things located there? Nice. You're chuckling, right? The results, because I'm here to tell you that I don't think at this point in your training, you need to spend time reading the results unless it's of real interest to you, okay? And you're dying to understand what that structural equation model showed or the regression equation, et cetera. I think you can get away with not reading the results, okay? I think I even have doctoral students for whom reading the results section of an article is especially challenging because we haven't gotten through some of the basics yet. All right. So the nice thing is articles are organized in such a way that you can skip right through the results because the very first paragraph of the discussion section should summarize for you what they found in the study. So there's one tip. All right. So I would say to you that the other, some other pieces of advice that I would give you today, they are find some way to organize your materials. You and I have all been in a situation, maybe an undergrad, where you're writing a paper and you have 25 articles spread across the floor, or worse, you have 25 articles that are PDFs that have ridiculous titles like 013A1B. You have no idea who published that, but you know you've seen something and you want to cite it. You're going to spend more time trying to find where it was said and what's the appropriate citation than you are actually writing. So find a good way to organize your stuff. Maybe it's using those folders and downloading them from the um, searches that you do in a database. Maybe it's taking the extra step, which will pay off. I cannot tell you how many times I have to tell my students this. You're going to find an article and you'll be like, oh yeah, I found one that's great. Download it right then and there. Chances are you're going to go back in when you're not logged into VPN or you're not logged into the wireless secure network, and then it won't let you access the PDF. Right? You go, I've had it once, but I can't find it again. I go back and I can't access it. Often because you're not logged in correctly, but do yourself a favor. If you think it's of interest, just download it. You can always trash it later. Okay. And name it something meaningful. Either the title of the article or like the author's name. All right. So another piece of information is to use a citation manager. If you don't want to use Zotero or RefWorks or whatever, then do it yourself, but by God, make use of tools that you have available to you. I do not recommend Google Scholar as your first search ever, ever. It's good, it's helpful. Where it's most helpful is you have an article in mind. Maybe you saw something in a reference list, you forgot to print it out or download it. Type the article title into Google Scholar, get it to identify that article for you, 
and then click on the quote button at the bottom, this little quote symbol, and it will print out for you the citations that you can copy and paste right there and then into your reference list. And again, I will mimic Kristen's warning. Not always could be perfect, but it's a better starting place than you typing it out. So Google Scholar is your friend. Google Scholar will also show you hidden behind this a little bit is the links for the HTML and PDFs, but only if you're logged in correctly to the case network, right? It will show you all of the ones that are available. And then my last, um, well, second to last piece of recommendation is, and Pranet will probably have um, PTSD from seeing this, but um, in 528, you will be asked to summarize six empirical articles in a matrix. And you're like, you're like, I can't. <laughs> it's not that hard. If you learn how to use the matrix correctly, find something. I don't care if you use a matrix, you can use index cards, you can use OneNote, you can make handwritten notes, it doesn't matter. Find a way though to help keep track of what it is that you're finding and break it down. This is where you're putting the pieces, parts of the frog that you pull out, okay? Here is the heart, here is the liver, here is the spleen. I don't know if frogs even have spleen, but you know, you get the idea. And this will help you. I tell my students, I would much rather spend five minutes looking through a matrix like this where I have like 10 pages of 20 articles summarized for me, then sifting through 30 or 40, 20 page articles trying to remember what it is that what they did, right? This is gives you the quick overview of what the study did, the kind of sample that they had, whatever you choose. You can tailor it to be your own column. Maybe you wanna look at intervention for it, okay? So use something like this. You'll get a copy in 528. And finally, don't be afraid to ask for help. Again, I was a little hubris um, and, you know, got, got my comeuppance. I learned, but it was a really good learning experience going to the library and saying, I can't figure out a way to get these genetic articles out of my search for caregiving. I don't care about the 325 gene, blah, blah, blah. I want caregiving, right? in palliative care and cancer. Um, and he showed me how to use terms like near or within and really limit the results. So ask for help. Yeah. On the connecting part one to part two, can you search for empirical? Can you limit it to empirical? Yes, you can. You can also limit it to um, peer reviewed articles. There's lim limiters on the side. Empirical is one of them. Yes. Great. Empirical is usually one. Um, peer review is definitely one. You also can exclude things. So excluding dissertations, for example. You don't really want those, even though they might be empirical. Uh, excluding articles from a different country or written in a different language. Yeah. So usually many of them have empirical, but you can also, if it doesn't have empirical, you can say I'm a quantitative or qualitative articles. So that's where you go. Okay. All right. Thanks for your attention. Have a good uh, afternoon. Thank you so everybody for coming to our Lunch and Learn. We'll see you next week. Uh, we'll be here together in Mandel Center on Wednesday for our next one. Have a great finish your week. Thank you.